Okay, we're good. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Linnell, and I am with Salt Lake County Aging and Adult Services, the host agency for this year's Utah Elder Justice Conference. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Hospice, a generous Medicare gift session, which we are recording for later viewing. As an attendee of this session, you will only be able to see the presenter and yourself. All other attendees are hidden from your view. Um, you can click on the participants button in the lower right of the screen to see the panelists. Please ask any questions that you have through the Q&A, which is also located on the bottom right of your screen. And uh, with that, I will now turn the time over to our uh, presenter who will introduce themselves. Are you guys able to hear me? Yes, okay. I can't hear you, but you can hear me. So great, that's perfect. All right, well, thanks everybody for coming. Really and truly what a gift to get to spend time together in this creative way and in a creative environment. Um, my name is Miriam Hermanson and I am an LCSW and I have been doing hospice work for the past seven years. Um, and really and truly what a gift to get to do my job. I love what I do on a daily basis, which I'm not sure everybody can say that, but I definitely can. So that is pretty wonderful. Um, and one of the big things that I've found throughout my time of being a hospice social worker is that many people truly don't know what's available just because we don't know. And so I'm happy just to share the gift of hospice so that you can know about it for yourself, your loved ones, participants in your senior centers, whoever it might be that could benefit from hospice and might not know it. So um, please feel free, like I said, to ask questions as we go along. I'm happy to entertain whatever you've got. So and if I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. But if I know, I'm happy to give you the answer. So we're just going to dive in. Um, so what is hospice care? Hospice care is in-home health care for individuals who have a life-limiting condition and are no longer wishing to seek curative treatment. Um, with that being said, Medicare covers this at 100% for individuals who are 65 years or older. Um, and Medicare guidelines state that a person on hospice um, may pass away in six months time or less from whatever condition they're choosing not to treat. That's a really tricky guideline in terms of the fact that none of us have crystal balls and know exactly when life will be over for any of us. Um, so I encourage people to ask the questions and see if they may qualify instead of just assuming that, oh, I, it's, I have more than six months, right? So it's good to just reach out to someone and say, hey, what do you think about what I have going on? Do you think that I might be a candidate for hospice? The other piece with that is that that six month time frame can be expanded. So let's say I have a patient that comes on hospice services and um, we're truly, we're going to do a pretty serious evaluation at three months while being on hospice, another evaluation at six months. And from that point in time on, if they still qualify in that we still feel like they're declining, we will do an evaluation every two months to check and see if they still qualify for services. So I have some patients that are on service for days to weeks to years, really and truly. So there's a wide span in how much time a person can have hospice care. Um, there's sometimes this confusion with home health care services versus hospice services. Many companies offer both. Um, the company I currently work for offers just hospice services, which honestly I appreciate in terms that we don't do home health because they are two very different avenues of care. Um, home health is for individuals who are homebound with a therapy need or an open wound. Um, the homebound status is critical for someone uh, qualifying for um, home health. Um, home health is also time specific. So many times a person might have home health for a two months period of time, they're gonna have a care team come in. And then when that care is complete, they will then leave the home and life will carry on. Um, it's very patient specific on home health care. Um, on hospice care, the ways that it's different is that really and truly it's for the individual who is our hospice patient, but it's also for their entire family. Um, it is not time specific in terms of, like I was saying, that it could start out at being, you know, a couple days, weeks, months, or years, you know, and it has that whole range of service that it might be. 
The other thing, there is no homebound status needed. So I have hospice patients. I had a gentleman that really and truly came on hospice. I'm going to make up the, the time frame, but let's say he came on hospice in May. He was still working at his job and he continued to do so until I'm going to say middle of June when his decline became very serious. And then he passed away a couple weeks from that time period. So he was able to have hospice services while working and continue to do the things he wanted to do in life and didn't have to be just at home. Um, also, the idea that it's for the entire family, I love this piece as well in that, so myself as a social worker, um, each family that I work with, I'm working with the patient, but a lot of my work is really and truly with the caregiver or loved one. So many times I'm working with a spouse who's watching their spouse decline, or I'm working with a son or a daughter who's being a caregiver for their mom or their dad. Um, it, it can be a huge, huge range. It's I've everywhere from you know grandchildren to great grandchildren. It can be whoever needs our care and services really can have care and services from the hospice social worker as well as the chaplain, um, our nurse and our doctor and our aide. They're specifically for the patient themselves. But the support services, which is my favorite part, um, we get to help work with everybody. Uh, qualifying for hospice. So for a person to qualify for hospice services, there needs to be a doctor's order. Um, so I might come and see, you know, Jane or Susie and say, oh my goodness, you definitely could use our help. But then the job is to reach out to a doctor to say, I believe this person might qualify with their current condition. What do you think? And the doctor then gets to make that decision. Um, I've listed just some of the conditions that can qualify for hospice here, and we'll just go through those just briefly. Um, if I was the nurse, I'd give you really detailed nursing information, but because I'm not, I'll just give you kind of the overview. So um, ALS, um, cancer that is widespread and aggressive. And again, a person with, let's say this cancer that's widespread and aggressive, they are no longer treating. So if a person is getting chemotherapy or radiation, then they would not be a hospice candidate. However, whenever they might decide that, you know, I'm, I'm tired of feeling sick and miserable and I'm tired of being at the doctor's office and I'm tired of all of this care that I have to do in order to have um, treatment, when they're ready for that to end, they could come over to hospice services instead. Um, Alzheimer's and dementia. This one's a little bit tricky, just in the fact that a person could, has, could have Alzheimer's or dementia for a very, very long period of time. So for it to be hospice um, criteria, that has to be fairly far advanced. So it can't just be a little bit of, you know, forgetfulness here. That it has to be pretty serious. Um, general decline. We have a lot of patients that fall into this category that just really and truly their bodies are just wearing out and becoming tired. Um, so increased falls, um, weight loss, things in that category. Many times we have both of those together. If I have a patient that's falling, you know, they went from being fairly stable and doing okay to having falls, let's say on a weekly basis or even a few during a month, um, they're scary. One fall can definitely really change a person's life. Um, so general decline with increased falls and weight loss can be a, a qualifier. Uh, liver disease, neuro, neuro, I can't say the word, neurological diseases, Parkinson's disease, pulmonary diseases with their room air saturations of 88% or less, um, renal failure, a stroke or a CBA, heart disease, and protein calorie malnutrition. So there's just a few of the diagnoses that can qualify. And again, a doctor has to write an order saying that I am ordering hospice care for Mrs. Jones based on the fact of having one of these conditions or more. Um, this, I think, is really critical, and I think that we as society and human beings believe that a person on hospice looks like the gentleman on the left, uh, in the hospital bed, obviously not doing well, um, caregivers are present, we're getting ready to say goodbye, but the reality is, is that a hospice patient could look like him, absolutely, but could also look like a gentleman on the right. Um, like I said, I had a patient, you know, that was working and exercising and there's plenty of things that hospice patients can do and still be a patient, even if they don't look like the gentleman on the left. So that's what makes it tricky too, is that they don't all look the same, that we have to have a wide range of view to try to figure out who really and truly can benefit from our care. Um, what is hospice care? So it's in-home healthcare for individuals with a life-limiting condition. 
I want to qualify the in-home piece. Um, I also love this factor at hospice is that people could, we can come to someone wherever their home might be. So that might be at home. That might be at their loved one's home. That might be in a skilled nursing facility. That might be assisted living. It might be a memory care unit. Um, it can be wherever home is for them, except for the hospital. That is the one place, traditionally, there's a couple of caveats there, but overall, the hospital is not a place where hospice care can be given because Medicare says they will pay for the hospital or for hospice, but not both together at the exact same time. So that is why that's important. Um, this is the other piece I also love. I mentioned that Medicare covers us, which is absolutely true. Um, for people that are 65 and older that have Medicare, um, there's typically no cost. There's no co-pays. Um, it's all services are included. They will not get a bill from us. Uh, if a person is, and we're obviously focused on the aging population, but just for general education purposes, it's, I think it's nice to know how it works for anybody. Um, if a person has traditional insurance, really and truly they're there very likely could be a cost with co-pays. However, many individuals that come to hospice have paid a lot of money, right? They've paid a lot of money into the healthcare system to get the care they needed in order to fight whatever illness they might be having. And so as a result, many times there's not a whole lot of um, deductible left by the time they get to hospice services. Um, but again, for people that are 65 and older, there is no cost whatsoever for our care. Um, again, the person should pass away in six months time or less. However, that is not always how it works. And so it's really on a case by case basis. Um, what does hospice care include? So there is a medical director that oversees all of the care being given. Um, that is a doctor that works specifically with the hospice team. If an individual has a doctor they've been seeing for years and years and wants to also include them in care, that definitely can happen. Um, it's not super common, but it can be done. Um, we can have both the medical director for the hospice team providing care as well as the primary care physician in the community. Um, there's also nursing services. This is one of the biggest gifts is that there's an RN and also LPNs that can come to the home. Um, many of our nurses, we're seeing patients at least once a week unless they tell us no. <laughs> and then we're gonna fight a little bit and say, hey, look, we really wanna get in there. We really wanna be a part of your care team and a part of this journey with you. Um, so our RNs are going to be in the home at least once a week, but I have many that are seeing patients up to three times a week if they have a wound care need or other issues that need more intensive care, they definitely can do that. Um, as well as towards end of life, our nurses make daily visits just to be on top of the situation, what's happening, and also provide education and comfort to our families because it's scary, right? To have your loved one in the middle of passing away is overwhelming and emotional and it's a lot to take in. So we make sure that our families have the care they need um, so they can you know, receive good care that way. Social work and chaplain care. Um, this is something too that, like I said, I, I'm a little biased being a social worker, but I think it's just a really, really nice gift is that we have a social worker and a chaplain assigned for each and every one of our patients. Um, and our company provides weekly visits if families are open to that from both social work and chaplain. Some companies provide every other week, some are monthly. There's a whole range in how those services are provided. Um, but our company strongly believes that that is a huge part of the service and care too, is having that support. And so we offer weekly visits. Um, I'll, I'll be really honest, it's truthful or it's challenging sometimes um, with chaplain care in Utah, people hear, hear the word chaplain and think, oh my goodness, I don't want anyone in my home telling me how to uh, think or what to believe. Um, and maybe we'll say, you know, I have my own religious community. I do not need chaplain support. Um, we try to encourage families to at least let the chaplain come once so they can really see and feel what it is to have chaplain care versus just the assumptions. Again, we humans are really good at assuming that we have it all figured out and sometimes we don't. So we really try to get our um, chaplain social work in the home at least once to let them see what the care and services can be about and then they can make a choice if they want to have us come or not. There is no requirement, of course, um, but we do really try to help with that. Um, the chaplains definitely, their goal is not to change or modify religious beliefs, but it is definitely to support um, the spiritual journey that passing can create for many of us. Um, the other piece uh, of social work, I want to talk a little about what social work does. So a, a huge piece is emotional support, 
Um, it's coping, it's helping with grieving, it's helping with planning and preparing. So if a family um, doesn't have any more trade planning done at this period in time, we will definitely help with that conversation and provide resources. Um, if they need help with creating an advanced directive, either for medical needs or if they need it for financial, we can refer for people to help with that. Um, just kind of making sure that all of our ducks are in a row and that our, our families and patients feel comfortable, as comfortable as they can be on the journey. Um, home health aides, I say, are worth their weight in gold. They provide an incredible, incredible service. Um, a lot of it has to do with as our bodies do decline, there's a lot of incontinence needs. Um, and with that, a lot of um, personal care needs to be done in terms of hygiene. Uh, our home health aides can visit our patients um, uh, six times a week if, if they need that level of care. We do try, do try to give them Sundays off just so they can have at least one day off. Um, but anywhere from one to six visits a week is what our home health aides are in the home for. Um, they help with um, transitioning, with showering, with bathing, with changing briefs, with making a light meal or some light housekeeping. Um, their range of services is, is pretty broad. Um, and then so medical supplies, this one is also a big one. So um, if our patients need a wheelchair, a walker, a hospital bed, um, a bedside commode, um, if they need any uh, incontinence supplies, which are incredibly expensive, they need diapers, wipes, gloves, um, chucks, which are a, a cloth that can sit or a absorbent barrier that can sit between a person and their seat to help urine, for example, not go from the patient's body into the let's say couch they're sitting on. Um, all of that we have delivered right to the patient home. Again, there's no cost for any of it. It's just a part of the care. And then all medications related to the terminal diagnosis. So any medication that helps with comfort as well as the terminal diagnosis, hospice also covers. And again, is just delivered right to the home, um, which is lovely. There's no need to run to the pharmacy. It's all just right there. Um, the other beautiful gift is the 24 hour um, emergency call line. So if our family has a concern, it doesn't matter if it's three in the morning or Five in the morning, right? Whenever it is, we have um, a nurse that's available to provide support and care to our patients and families if they need it. Any questions on any of that? There doesn't seem to appear to be any questions at this time. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. This will be really, I already covered, I got ahead of myself, but um, really and truly, wherever a person lives is where we're gonna go. So an apartment, a single family home, living with family, assisted living, skilled nursing facility, any of those places hospice can be. Um, that does bring up a good a good point though that I do wanna talk about is that let's say a person is, let's say my hospice patient's name is Joe and he does live all by himself. Part of my job, especially as social work is figuring out what kind of support he needs and what that's going to look like in his home. Hospice is a great service and a beautiful gift However, if there's nobody else there with them, there's gonna come a point in time where we're concerned about that, that really and true, that probably is not safe. And so a big piece of my job then is going to be to help that patient as well as their family or friends or whoever they might have in their care circle to help support them and figure out if we're gonna have somebody move in in terms of family or a loved one, or if we need to hire private care to come in. Um, in terms of private care, it is not something that we would provide at the hospice company, but I would be more than happy to help my family by saying, here's some resources, here are some companies that can help with that process. Um, also, if we do determine that the person is not safe to remain living at home, I can also bring in a person who can help navigate the journey of placement within a facility. Um, that There's is a not question, Miriam. Great. Hi. Yes, uh, the question is, are personal aides able to provide respite for the family? Um, I'd love some more information on what they mean by respite. So um, I would say in small periods of time, I would say yes. So many times our company does something. If a, let's say my the wife of my patient says, you know, I really just need to get out, get my hair done and go shopping and just have a couple hours to myself. What our company would do in that instance is then line up back-to-back -back visits. We would have, if possible, have our home health aide go visit and then have a social worker visit and then the chaplain visit and put them all, just for example, right, put them all in a row. So that would be three hours of care that we could provide, no cost again to the family, but the caregiver could then leave the home and breathe, right, for a few hours and take care of what needs to be done. Um, does that answer the question? 
Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, another option would be to have a volunteer come in. So hospice companies, are, and I might have a slide later on, I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> jumping ahead of myself, but hospice companies also are required by Medicare to have 5% of the care that we provide is provided by a volunteer. Um, those volunteers are people that we recruit and we try to bring in to help with situations just like that, right? That maybe we have someone that needs to have a break from their home. We can maybe have a volunteer come in to sit and provide care for them while the loved one can be gone. We have another question. Yeah. Um, how in depth of housekeeping will hospice provide? That's a really good question. They, the words that are usually said are light housekeeping. Um, that leaves a lot of interpretation to be done. Um, I've seen caregivers that have come in and, and helped to do like washing some dishes or loading the dishwasher, maybe a light wipe down of items in the bathroom. Um, I've seen some vacuuming. I've seen some dusting, um, which to me is pretty good, really and truly. However, they're not going to come in and spend the entire hour deep cleaning the patient's home, right? That would be considered not light housekeeping, but they definitely can provide, like I said, some some little chore help here and there. So, is that okay? It's weird to not see all your faces. <laughs> okay, we're gonna say that's true and good. Um, this we did talk a little bit about, but hospice care is available 24 seven, but doesn't move in with our families. We definitely start care for some individuals and they have this idea that we're gonna come and just be there day in and day out. Um, we're available, but we're not going to be there and present all of those hours. Um, that's definitely a big piece of education the hospice team does with the family is to help them understand what our care does look like and what is available. And then also to help with private duty care if it needs to be hired. So I'm going to, oh dear, hold on one second, attempt to click on this link and see if we can get it to work. Okay, give me just one second. This is how Jaredette Sager remembers her husband. He was a very adventurous, spontaneous man. Got along with everybody. Everybody loved him. A man who enjoyed hiking and running in Bloomsday. So even before he was diagnosed with ALS, it was obvious that something was wrong. One of the things that I noticed was that his gait. Yeah, it looks like forward. it's a, a black, a black so video fast. right now. And um, other signs. One of the things that really bothered him is he was dropping. You hear it or not even hear it? As the disease yes, was I hear the audio, just um, can't see oh. it. When he started falling mm. in the house, I wish I knew what to do. He <laughs> just what stepped I do. down. Uh, let me see if we could get Justin. Okay. okay I'm so okay. sorry. I wish I was a tech genius and I would just figure it out, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a message in Justin, so just one moment. <laughs> Perfect. Folks, Justin is logging in to this session and he will be helping to make this video play very shortly. Thank you Perfect. for your patience. Good morning. Um, we, I believe, Marion, you may have to share your whole screen rather than uh, just the PowerPoint. Okay. Let's have you try that real quick. Tell me how to do that. I'm happy to try. No worries. At the very bottom where the share button is, it seems to lack confidence. There'll be a little pop up. 
our little drop down menu and you can say share screen one or whichever screen you're normally on. Hmm. If not, we can take over and share that video for you. I, I'm not seeing the button to be really truthful. Um, oh, let me do this for you. One second. Okay, now self esteem issues. Um, there are various reasons for anxiety and low self-esteem. And we can hear a different presentation, Justin, in the background. And lastly, I want to emphasize technology like iPads, apps, Zoom, are not made, you know, for older adults. Okay, Miriam, now go ahead and do your um, sharing again. Okay. And this time pick share screen. Well, I'm not seeing the sharing button is the issue, I believe, Justin. So I, I can see my video, but it's like you guys can't see it on your side. At the and use the smart technology that will go out of this one. Those barriers. Um, so, do you see the share button now, Marion? At the very bottom of the screen. The very bottom, I do not know. Um, how did you share it before? Did you do your share before? That's a grand question. I I don't know, and I could move past it. Maybe maybe just come back. I don't know. Um. Let let's let me get your presentation going and I'll share it from my end. Okay. It's on slide 10, if that's helpful. We have a question while we're waiting, Miriam. Wonderful, that's great. Okay, let's see. The question is, um, I have dementia. In the dementia blogs, I, um, I read of patients who want to end their lives by stopping eating and drinking with family support. In order to experience um, organ failure uh, so that they would qualify for hospice, have you encountered this? I might have to do this eventually. Thank you for the question. Um, so that's really, really tricky. The, re the reality is, is that um, a hospice company cannot, um, to the way to legally say this appropriately, they, they can't, um, we can't kill someone, right? I'm just gonna put it very you know, brief or uh, frankly in that statement, however, if a person does choose to stop eating and drinking, that is completely their right to do that as as life progresses. Um, as a result of that, if they then are losing weight, the weight loss could be a qualifier for hospice, if that makes sense. So it's kind of a background way to get hospice care and services. Um, and also, like you're saying, if um, organs did shut down, you know, and we're being shut down, that also could help a person get to hospice. Um, on the flip side, it's it's a very long journey, right? That's not a simple um, solution. I would encourage um, someone in that place, right, to definitely get some support and, and talk with a therapist before we get to that point, right, of feeling like, what can I do and how can I 
make the time that I do have here on earth the best it can possibly be, even with a condition like dementia. That's what I would say. Justin, thanks for saving the day. <laughs> Justin, we have no sound, at least I don't have any sound. And Justin, I don't have to the video either. I can I can move on without it if you prefer I do that. Yes, please. Sorry about that, okay. Miriam. It, no problem at all. No, it's totally let's, fine. We'll go back to your presentation. It's all good. All right. So let's make sure I get myself in the right spot. Um, and now it's being funny. We'll see if I can. There we go. Okay. So advanced care planning. Um, advanced care planning is, like I talked a little bit previously, is also a beautiful gift of having hospice services in your home. Um, completion of advanced directives. So an advanced directive, the largest thing that it, well, it does two really important things. It's a legal document that can be completed in a patient's home without a lawyer, which I appreciate very much that we can do it together. Um, it needs to have myself as the employer, as the a paid person to be there is fine. We have the patient present as well as the caregivers they're appointing, if possible, to be their healthcare power of attorney, as well as a non-related party. So we can have a neighbor, a friend, um, anybody who's not being named in the directive and anyone who is not benefiting in any way from the directive being established can make it a legal document. So throughout the document, it's a four-page document. Um, it lists the patient that's being you know, cared for. Then there's a chance to assign um, two medical power of attorneys. Um, and it's important to have two because we never know what might happen, right? Something could happen to one of our power of attorneys and it's nice to have someone to fall back upon as a second power of attorney. The next important piece of the document is it lays out um, what the healthcare wishes are of the person who is established in the directive. So if I, for example, have chosen to be a DNR um, and do not want a feeding tube, do not want to have any extensive measures done, I can elect that for myself. Um, I also can say what power I want my medical power of attorney to have. So if I want them to have the ability to place me in a skilled nursing facility, if needed, I can give them that power. If I want them to be able to see my medical records, I can give them that power or not, either way. Um, we also, go ahead. I'll keep going. Okay, we also establish a new pulsed form. A pulsed form is a physician's order for life sustaining treatment. Um, this is a form, the, the biggest thing that this form is doing, again, is talking about the DNR. If we want to be a do not resuscitate, um, this is what is established by this form. A beautiful gift about a pulsed form in my mind is that it's something that I could create one today. And if um, let's say next week on Tuesday, I say, you know, actually my wishes have changed. I want something different. I can create a new one and the pulse is only as good as the most recent one that has been completed. So if I make one next week on Tuesday, that's the one that we will follow and hold up. Um, it is signed by a doctor. So it's making it, um, a doctor's order that we're following. Um, and like I said, it's a simple, it's a one page document that really into the hospice care team can help guide a family through and a patient through very easily. And then the funeral arrangements. Um, it's so nice to have this done before we need it. Um, if we, it is not completed before we actually do pass over, we can work on it, but it's much more stressful. Um, it's just a nice thing to have planned before we actually get there. All right. Oops. 
Um, the other great benefit I see to having um, hospice is peace at the time of passing. So if a person in general were to pass away at home without having hospice, um, the process is not so fun in terms of that EMTs need to come, typically a police officer will come. Um, it's, it's not the scene any of us want. However, if and when a person is on hospice and does pass away at home, there is no call 911, there is no coroner. Really and truly all that happens is there's that simple call into the hospice company to say that my loved one has passed. At that point in time, what happens is that a nurse will come and she will assess the patient and confirm that they have passed or not passed. Um, if they have passed, she will do um, just some basic um, physical care for the body to make sure that it's clean and in a comfortable spot. Um, and this is what I really, really, really love is that at that point, we encourage families, especially during this last year of COVID, we encourage families to come then and see their loved one at, at the home, um, that they can spend time together, they can grieve as needed as a family, um, but there's no massive rush in calling the mortuary. Um, the law here in Utah is that we do need to call the mortuary within 24 hours of passing. Um, I don't encourage families to wait that long. A couple of hours is usually plenty. Um, but it is nice that it gives us time to be together in a comfortable, natural setting of being at home versus being somewhere else. Um, the other piece of this is that typically, I would say in my years of doing this work, I may have seen, I'd say less than a handful of patients that have passed when we as the care team weren't quite expecting it. Most passings we know are coming. Um, usually we have a couple day notice as the body does decline and slow that we um, will tell families and educate families of saying, you know, here's the changes that we think you're going to see and here's how this process might work so they can be prepared and ready and that it's not a complete shock and surprise. Um, veterans benefits. This is also a really neat piece of hospice. So um, we, we are part of the We Honor Veterans program. It's a program that's in conjunction with the VA and hospice companies for the most part. Um, and what that is, is that if we know that we have a patient that has served in the military, we will do a military salute for that individual, which is really kind of a neat ceremony for the patient as well as their family. Um, we'll have a person come with a certificate and a flag and just present a, just a truly a thank you and an honoring of our veterans for what they have done for ourselves and for our country, um, which is just a nice gift. Families have talked a lot about how much they've enjoyed having that honoring of their loved one during this time. The other piece that's a, a great financial benefit really and truly is that if a person is a veteran and enrolled in the veteran system and on hospice, those two things are both key in this. So hospice and being a veteran and enrolled in the system. If that is the case, there is an option for a free skilled nursing facility stay. Um, it's called an end of life contract. Um, and really there's no cost whatsoever, which is a huge savings um, typically for a person to go into a skilled nursing facility, I'm gonna rough ballpark figure, tell you about $6,000 is usually the cost for one month at a nursing home. And so if we can save a patient $6,000 a month, that's pretty significant. I have a patient that was at the nursing home, I wanna say for, I think it was seven or eight months. It was a long, long period of time. Um, and honestly, he did better and then came off of hospice services and moved out of the facility, but it was a great gift for him to have that care as he was living alone by himself. So that was wonderful for him. Um, success stories, a good death. The, the world might think that's a crazy comment to talk about a good death, but I really do believe that we can have a good death. Um, I had a for myself, um, I love my work, but a lot of what I love about it is that the fact that our patients normally are older, which I definitely appreciate. If we were all dying when we were 20s and 30s and 40s, that'd be incredibly challenging. Um, however, there is times too that I have had good deaths with younger patients. So I had a patient that was 27 years old. Um, she had ovarian cancer and she'd been fighting for two years. Um, she had two small children. They were I think about two and four. Um, and this was hard. I mean, really and truly, I put myself in her shoes and thought, oh my goodness, what a challenging road for my patient, as well as for her children and her spouse and her parents. Um, but, you know, she told us she was in tears the first day that we came and she said, this is such a gift for me to know that I can no longer have to fight. 
in terms of fighting the cancer, right? And going to the doctor and all of the care and treatment she was doing that was honestly causing life to be not very fulfilling or good for her, but she was fighting because she wanted to be around for her children primarily. Um, but for her to look at us and say, oh my goodness, thank you for being here and allowing me to not have to fight was a pretty amazing gift. Um, this woman who I'm thinking of, she honestly happened to pass away sitting up on her couch with her son next to her cuddling into her arm. Um, that to me is pretty amazing, you know, as compared to being in a hospital setting, just sterile and, you know, all of those things. I just thought how nice for her to get to be able to pass right at home with her children. Um, we also had an adult son providing 24 hour care for his mom with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and just assisting with family dynamics as well as assisting with medication management was huge for him. Um, as well as just helping provide guidance throughout this journey. That was pretty scary. You know, if it's your first time to be with someone who's passing, it is scary. It's a hard, hard road. And so what a gift it was for him to, to let, you know, for him to know that we were there. If he needed us, we could be there within minutes, which was great. Um, really and truly caregivers and patients need hospice care. Um, and helping spread the word is huge. That's why I wanted to give the presentation today is because, like I said, when I began is that many people truly just don't realize how much hospice can do and when it's okay to have us come in. Um, it's very rare that I have a patient or family say, oh my goodness, you guys came too soon. Almost always what I hear from families is I wish I would have known about you months ago and we could have had help, you know, much earlier than we actually did. So. Um, hey, Miriam, this is a five minute warning. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, there's definitely, this is another point I just want to make really quickly is that patients do have choice. So there are a ton of hospice companies out there. Um, and I would never want someone to feel like because they chose one company, they have to remain there. If someone has chosen someone and care and services are not going well, of course, first work with that company and see if we can make that a better relationship and see if care can be given the way we need to be given. But if really and truly it's not working out, it is absolutely okay for a patient to elect to choose a different hospice company. Um, we had Elevation Hospice. It was formed by a social worker, which I appreciate that he really and truly wanted to drill down to making sure that patients have what they need. And not just making the company successful, but making sure that our patients and families have the care that they deserve. Um, we believe that our Medicare funds belong to patients. People have paid into this system for throughout their whole entire lives. And we want to make sure that you're getting the care that is needed when it really is needed um, that you deserve. Um, we have an excellent care team. Um, I can say that almost every employee that we have doing our work is doing it because they love their job. It's not just work or a hassle. It's a great gift to get to do what we do. Um, we can evaluate a patient for services 24 hours a day. So it doesn't matter when it is. If there is an emergent need, even without that doctor's written order, we can come and evaluate a patient and see if they do qualify for hospice and then work on getting the orders and things put together afterwards. The other nice gift that we at Elevation have is we have a palliative um, and in-home primary care provider program which what that means is if we have a patient that needs to have a doctor come to see them at home versus going into the doctor's office, we can come to them outside of hospice care. We can still be a primary care provider for a patient at their home, which is also very nice. Um, and it's never too early to begin the conversation. Um, people think hospice is a bad word, but hospice is not a bad word. It's actually a beautiful, beautiful gift. So if, if we can start talking about it and learning about what our wishes are, our loves and wishes are, that's a great gift to everyone. Um, and our patients and families really do get to be in charge. We, as the care team, of course, have education and knowledge, but if we come in and my patient says, you know what, I don't want to do X, Y, or Z, most of the time we're going to say, okay, that that's all right, that you get to be in charge right now, which is a great gift too, in terms of, I think when we have a medical condition that's affecting our health, it's really easy to feel like we're in the back seat and not in the driver's seat. And this lets the person hopefully have some more control and say in what's happening in their lives. Any other questions? Yes, we do have a question. Um, okay. if the question is, who are your medical physicians working for your hospice and in-home primary care program? Who are our physicians, I think was the question. Yes, yeah. I believe so. Okay, so we have Dr. Stephen Heath. He is our main physician. He has an office in Holiday, 
And then we have Dr. Joshua Oaks, who is up north in our Bountiful area. And then we have a new one. I have to look up her name, but I want to get it right. Her last name is Minor, but I want to find her first name so I can tell you. Um, Charlene Minor is our newest physician who is in Utah County. So we do have three doctors here in Utah. Anything else? Great. I don't see any other questions coming in. Okay. So. I have this last video, but I'm afraid it won't actually play. <laughs> You'll be able to hear it. So I'm not sure if it's even worth trying, but maybe I'm, let's see. Give me just one second. Let's see if it will work. And maybe not. They worked on our practice sessions, but practice in the real life don't always line up. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I don't know that's going to work. So I think I'll just pass on my last video, but really and truly thanks so much. I'm everyone. sorry, Mary. Can you say that one more time? You need you need the presenter rule. Well, I, there's one more video I was going to try to show, but I, it's not working on my end, which we could either show it or not show it. I'm good either way. Um, all we are we at a time? I just about. let's do this. We're going to make sure everyone sees that video. We'll do a, an email blast to all of our attendees. Okay, perfect. And they will be able to see that video. We'll get that from you. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. And we do have a comment. Um, okay. It says, thanks so much for the wonderful information. I am the person who asked the question about hospice via stopping eating and or drinking. I appreciate everything you do to give people a good death and hope I can achieve the same for myself. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Well, Miriam, thank you so much for that very helpful and informative presentation. Uh, we have reached the end of this session of the Utah Elder Justice Conference, and I want to thank you for attending the Hospice, a Generous Medicare Gift Session. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.